Okay. We're going to say a lechaim. It's a very special occasion. Baruch Hashem. Mazel Tov Baruch Yisrael. It was after all of the years of effort, Baruch Hashem has uh, become Jewish today. It's a huge celebration. And although the Torah tells us to love every Jew, the Torah tells us that you're supposed to love someone who becomes Jewish more. Mm-hmm. Why more? How do you do more? How do you do more? <laughs> so let's first figure out why more. So it says in the Talmud the following parable. There was once a king who had many shepherds, took care of many sheep. I can't say this right, that'll l'chaim. Say l'chaim first. <laughs> I don't want to say this correctly. That'll help you follow your Dvar Torah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Let me pour a yid l'chaim first. L'chaim baruch Yisrael. L'chaim, l'chaim baruch Yisrael. Baruch Yisrael, can you pour me l'chaim baruch Yisrael? L'chaim, l'chaim baruch. First time pour as a yid, yeah? That's pretty awesome. Yes, you can. Not too much. Listen. King has many shepherds, and the shepherds take care of all the sheep. Thank you. And the sheep go out to pasture one day, and all of a sudden, all the shepherds come to the king and say, Your Majesty, we have some interesting news. This deer has come to join the, the sheep. So the king says, That's fantastic. That's amazing. Take care of the deer, make sure no one bothers the deer. Feed the deer, make sure the deer has everything the deer needs. Don't bother this deer. Is, I, I want, I love this deer. This is great. You're very dear to him. <laughs> I helped myself back from that part. Anyways. <laughs> oh my gosh, it gets worse. Listen. Beautiful, I love it. The, the, the deer, the king gets the following news. The shepherds tell the king, Your Majesty, the deer has come back to the royal corral. He's come to the royal corral. So the king says, What? The deer has come to the royal corral. Unbelievable. Wow. Make sure the deer has everything it needs. All the food it needs and all the drink it needs. Make sure everyone's nice to the deer. Make sure the deer has it all. So in every day, the king has hundreds of shepherds, thousands of sheep. And every day the king calls on the royal shepherds, how is my deer doing? How is the deer doing? And one day, one of the shepherds has the temerity to challenge the king and say to the king, Your Majesty, I just have a question for you. <laughs> you have thousands of sheep. You have hundreds of shepherds. And the thing you always ask us about is this one deer. Why is the one deer so important to you? Why is it more important to you than all of the sheep and all of the shepherds? So the king says, I'll tell you why. Very simple. The sheep go out to pasture, and they come back to the royal corral, because this is their nature. But the deer... Where is the deer pasture? In the desert. So for the deer to leave the desert and decide to be here in the royal corral, to be with me in my home, for that, I need to show special appreciation. I need to show special gratitude. And, I, and, and therefore the king shows the deer this unique love. And so to Hashem says that we have to show unique love to someone who's left the, the vast desert of this world. It's not a great place. To, the Everything else isn't it's empty, and the Torah is the truth, and Torah is the best. But for a person to make that dramatic decision to realize it's all a big desert, not just a one-off decision, but not just like we do in Los Angeles with our smile and a wave, or like the three guys in the park bench. You know what the three guys in the park bench? Yankel is going like this, and Schmerl is going like this, and Laser is going like this. So someone says, dudes, what are you guys doing? They're sitting on the bench like this, like this, like that. Yeah, what are you doing? I'm driving my car. I'm driving my car. On this park bench, he's driving his car. What are you doing? I'm rowing my boat. I'm rowing my boat. And that's the third. What are you doing? I'm running away from these two crazies. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there, there's, it's possible to think you're running away from these two crazies and you're just sitting there on the park bench. But to actually make the move and to, and to uh, become Jewish requires enormous amount of effort. Enormous. A, a effort that uh, psychological physical, and uh, it's a huge investment of time, money, blood, sweat, and tears. And uh, Baruch Hashem, welcome. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Hopefully we'll all be good Jews. All of us will be good Jews. I'm Hashem by dear. What time? So what happens is like this. The Rebbe says it's not only the dears of, the, um, of other nations 
But all Jews have to be like the deers. All Jews are like the deers. In other words, especially in our generation, we're living in a time where there are challenges around us. And also, although we may not be as dramatic, it may not be as long, but all of us to be where, just to come to the Torah class today, that we're all sitting at this Torah class, says a lot about who we are as deers. There's a lot going on in Los Angeles tonight. <laughs> but we're not in Santa Monica by the beach. We're not going to the bar. We're here sitting by a Hasidic gathering, Tom Torah. We've left the desert. We're here. It says a lot about who we are. So on that note, I want to share with you something. You know, we're le- it's, na- it's human nature of many people. Be a little too hard on yourself. And there's a lot that Hashem asks of us. Hashem asks a lot of us. Especially when we live in a city. A city is such an intense place. So intense. I, I was uh, visiting Arizona two nights ago. I did a lot of a in there. And the uh, energy in Arizona is so much more calm. You can just feel it. It's partially because it's 119 degrees. You can't like do too much. But um, like a 30-day record of 115 degrees in a row. Whatever. Anyways, so... Um, the energy in the city is so intense, and even not as a Jew, it's, it's such an intense place, the city, and how much more so as a Jew, there's so many things you're obligated to do, and we make lots of mistakes. And the question is, why does Hashem put so much on our shoulders? Doesn't He know we're going to make these mistakes? What is it for? Why, why do we have all this complexity in ourselves? Complexity in ourselves, we know that there's good decisions we've made, and we make lots of other ones, and we rise and we fall and we fall and we rise. What's the point of it? So let's look at this from the prism of this week's Torah portion. This week we're reading about the second tablets. The first tablets, great, beautiful, wonderful. God gives us the tablets through Moses. It's beautiful, it's kosher. You can pinch our cheeks, we're so good. We are kosher for Passover. We're getting the tablets, God's talking to us, and the golden calf. Golden calf, not so good. After the golden calf, we get the second tablets. Where did the second tablets come from? Interesting thing, not everyone knows this. The second tablets were made in Moses' tent. How, what were they made out of? What did he have in his tent? In his tent, there was a, a cave. In the cave, there was sapphire. And Moses made the second tablets from the sapphire in his tent. The God says, yes? I thought that the sapphire came from when he broke the original Luthos. I'm sure there's many interpretations. I haven't heard that one yet. So uh, so in his tent, there is, there is the sapphire. And... The Torah says that God tells Moses, Psalacha. Psalacha means you should enjoy the remainder. What's left over, be lots of left over sapphire, you, that's yours. Moses, you will have the rest of the sapphire. The Torah says Moses became very wealthy with all the leftover sapphire. The question is, what do you do with the sapphire? Who is buying all the sapphire in the middle of the desert? Did Moses go on eBay, put all the sapphire on eBay? Like, hey, um, MosesSapphire.com. I mean, what, 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 where, what happened to all the sapphire? And, how, and, and more important question, why does Moses care about being rich? Moses loves the Jewish people. That's his life. When God says he's going to destroy us, God, Moses says, I don't want to have this world. I don't want the next world. Erase me from your book. Kill me. Do anything to me. But I do not want to see anything happen to any Jew. And God, and God listens to Moses. But Moses doesn't care about physical wealth. So what's God mean when he says, Psalacha? You could have the leftovers. You're going to become rich from this. What does Moses care about the physical wealth? What does he need? So I'm going to tell you another interpretation. Very relevant to us. Very, very re- Some can open our eyes and give us different glasses. And give, make us live and breathe and walk around with more stride in our step. A little bit more of a zippity dura. What do you say, Baruch? You're into zippity dura? Okay. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's understand something. When God makes the world, every other creature that God makes, the, makes God says... This is what it is. Let there be light, poof, there's light. Let there be uh, sky, poof, there's a sky. Let there be birds, poof, there's birds. Let there be animals, there's poof, there's animals. There's one creature that has a funny way that God describes the creature. God says when he creates man, let us make man. Why us? Who's the us that's making man? God is the one who makes all the creatures. Why did he say let us make man? So I'm sure we, some of you have heard Rashi's explanation. I want to share with you tonight the explanation of the Maharal. Maral, who is the creator of the golem, tells us a little bit more about the golem inside of us, our own golem. Um, Maral says this, every other creature, when God made the creature, he was done. Because as soon as any creature is made, as soon as it's made, that's all it is. For example, God makes a, uh, a, a dog. 
A dog is made, and what's dog going to be in 10 years? It's not going to be a cat, it's not going to be a chicken, it's going to be a dog. It's not going to be a scientist that discovers the cure for cancer. It's not going to be anything else other than a dog. A cat is a cat. You have a seed, you plant, you plant an apple seed, you know we're going to have an apple tree. What kind of tree will it be? You don't know exactly. We know what size it's going to be. You don't know how, what kind of apples exactly it's going to be. You know, it's, going to be, it's not going to be an orange tree. Everything is exactly the way it is that God made it to be that way. There's not much movement. Once, once God makes something, that's the way it is. There's only one creature that's an exception. Who is the exception? Human being. That's why God says, Let's, let us make man. God says, you are involved in the decision. It's not just me involved in what we're going to be. It's, it's, we have something in common. And it could be dramatic change. Shmerel the mayor goes to visit a school in Shmerel's town. Shmerel's the mayor. He comes to visit the town. And he goes to a school. He speaks to the principal of the school. He asks the principal, what do you guys need in the school? The principal says, in our school, you know what we need? We need to have a different kind of textbook. We need to have better lunches. We need to have more staff. We need to have smart boards in the fourth grade. And, this, and the secretary, the mayor, is writing everything down. And, this, and, and after they leave the, uh, the school, the secretary says to the mayor, um, how should we file my notes? Throw in the garbage. Rip it up, throw in the garbage. We're not going to do anything that you promised them? No, nothing. All right. You go to visit a university. Goes to the dean. What do you guys need in this college? Oh, we need to have another wing that, that's dedicated to the sciences. We need to have uh, more professors that are experienced. And we need to have, and goes on and on, we need a new dormitory, we need this. And the secretary is writing everything down. And the mayor and the secretary leave the office of the dean. And the dean says to the mayor, how should I file my notes? Where should I send these notes to? The mayor says, strip them up, throw them in the garbage. Mm -hmm. All right. Then they go visit a prison. Speak to the warden. And the mayor says to the warden, what do you guys need in the prison? The warden says, in the prison, you know what we need? The inmates here have terrible dinners, terrible lunches, terrible breakfasts. Everyone's sad. We need to have better lunches. We need to have better beds. We need to have bigger rooms. There's so much that's, that's not the way it's supposed to be here. And there's so much activity that they could be doing. They could be, having, they could be learn, learning things. They could be, have more fun things to do for them. It's boring. And, it's, and, and there's so much more we could do for them. The mayor says, to tell the secretary, write everything down. And they, they leave the... Um, Prison, and the mayor asks the secretary asks the mayor, "So what should I do with all my notes? I should throw it away, right?" No, 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 <laughs> don't throw it away. Everything that we said we were going to do, we're going to do. Oh, um, uh, can I ask why? The mayor says, "I'm not going back to elementary school. I'm not going back to college, but prison. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Human being is a little bit of a volatile thing, and you don't know. But animals aren't that way. Remember the foot of us." When he would lead a Hasidic gathering, sometimes people would just cry. They would just cry. Not necessarily they would cry tears of remorse, tears of joy, tears of wisdom. Just being in Rendell's presence, I remember when I went with my brother once to visit Rendell, my, my brother started to cry just, just seeing him. Just, just you, you felt something special around him. You felt there's something more in life. Special man. Anyways, Rendell's leading the Fabrengen, and uh, at this Fabrengen, the boys are crying. And Mendel says, it's good, it's, tears are okay, but don't do, do tears of a beaver. Now, I don't know if this is scientific or just a Mendel's beavers. This is what Mendel said. Mendel said like this, a beaver has great fur. It's used for many things. And so hunters try to catch beavers. And beavers go out, they, they, they build things, and they have these certain paths. They go from their lair, wherever they are, and they go out into the forest, and they, and they build, and they do, and they go back home. And the hunters try to catch them. And it's very easy to catch a beaver because beavers always follow a certain track. But the beavers, when they detect that, they, that the hunters have laid out a pit to catch them or something, they stop. They stop because they know they're about to be trapped. No, they s smell the scent, the human scent when they stop. They smell the human scent, thank you. I don't know if these are the factual beavers or Mendel's beavers. I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyways, they, they, they smell and they can detect... <laughs> And, they, and they're about to go away from the pit, but they can't, because this is the path they go in. And so they cry outside the pit, and then they walk in the pit, and they get caught. <laughs> so Mendel said, it's okay, to, it's okay to cry, but don't do the tears of a beaver. If you want, it, a human being is not meant to be like a beaver. That's, that's, that's what Mendel said about the beavers. There's another uh, analogy about, I think this has non-Jewish sources as well, but I do believe this is in, in, a, in a book of Jewish ethics, I don't remember which one right now. About the monkey, the monkey trying to get a banana. 
He reaches into this place to catch a banana, really to trap. He puts his hand to catch a banana, and the, the, his, it, the hole is small enough for his hand to go through, but not sm- big enough to take out a, the banana. But the monk doesn't want to let go of the banana. He has his banana. He doesn't want to let go. And because he doesn't want to let, let go, and he, he, gets, he gets caught. Similar way, a lot of people use an expression, this is what I am. What do you want from me? This is just who I am. I can't, I can't stop. I can't control. It's not true. When a person says, I can't stop. This is who I am. You know what you're really saying about yourself? You're saying, I am an animal. Everyone ha- we all have experience with anger and jealousy and hatred. All kinds of negative emotions. We all have that kind of stuff. It happens. It creeps into us. But we can let go. We can let go of the banana, of the, of the anger, of the frustration. We can let go of it. We don't have to hold on to it. We don't, have to, we don't have to breathe it. And we can let go. People think, no, I can't. I can't. I have to stay this way. My uncle, Chaim Yosef and Meshach Yaakov Vashon, was once in an audience with the Rebbe as a child. And the Rebbe was talking to him about his studies. He was a little kid. They asked him, what are you studying? He said, I'm studying Baba Kama. Attracted in Talmud. So he starts repeating the tractate for the Rebbe. Abov Zizikin Hasher. That's what he says. He forgot everything else. Factory reset. As often happens to people in front of the Rebbe. That's all he remembered. He knew, he knew a lot more before, but that was it. Abov Zizikin Hasher. So the Rebbe says the next word. Vahabur. So my uncle does it in his yeshivish um, accent and tune. Vahabur. And the Rebbe sort of corrected himself. And said Vahabur, like the way he said it. I, he never first said Vahabur. Like <laughs> then he never switched to like copying his his tune. Rabbi Heller, he runs the Kol on Kron Heights for many, many years, and Gesund. He said sometimes a father can say the right words to a child, but it's the wrong tune. It's the wrong tune. A lot of times a, a wife says to a husband, indefensible. You can't defend yourself in this accusation. It's not what you said, it's how you said it. It's the tune. What are you going to say? But, but it comes from somewhere. Why do you choose that tune? Where does the tune come from? The tune comes from something inside of you. And it's possible that you could, con- Tanya says you can control your words and your actions, but not necessarily can control the tune. And there's stuff inside you. So yes, we can let go of the animal, true. But Hashem tells us we could, do, we, could do, we could do more. Not just we could let go of the animal. Not, just we could, not only can we hard knuckle it and do the right thing, but Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu something more. Psalacha. What does Psalacha mean? You know what Psalacha means? Psalacha doesn't just mean leftovers. Psalacha means make a beautiful statue. Michelangelo said that when he sees, I'm waiting for Baruch's correction on this, but this is the way I heard it. When he sees a, uh, a block of wood or he sees a marble, a st- a marble or stone, he doesn't see a bar- marble and stone, he sees the statue. And when he is carving in the, in, this, in the marble, he's not actually trying to, to chip away at the marble and, and to form the statue. He's trying to he's trying to reveal the statue that's there. He sees a statue that's there. A friend of mine, his friend won a big big award for um, for, for being a sculptor, and and he's walking with him in the park. And the guy, as they're talking together, he like runs away and he looks at this broken tree. He's like, "Wow, can you see it?" And I was like, "See what?" He's like, "Look at this thing. right here. It could be the eyes and the nose and the shoulders. Wow, the shoulders right over here. The tree he sees." A statue. He sees a human being out of the... And, and, and that's what an artist does. Psalacha means, Hashem tells the Jew, that there is a diamond in the rough in yourself. That's, that's a fact. You are a diamond. That's what Hashem is saying. Psalacha. A friend of mine in his community, there was a guy who bought a large piece of land because he believed he would find diamonds in this piece of land. And he set up an office for himself on this, on this property. And he was digging... He put a lot of money into finding diamonds. And he searched for diamonds for days and weeks and months and years. That's two, maybe three years. He's searching for diamonds. And after two, three years, what does he find? Garnish mit garnish. Nothing. Nothing at all. So what does he do? He sells it. He sells to a larger company. The larger company comes, first thing you do is they clear out the whole thing, including his office, begin digging, and right away they find it. Where was the diamonds? True story. Under his, under his office. Under his office, they found over there the tunnels too. They found diamonds. So in a similar way, we could look in ourselves and say, there's no diamond here. There's nothing here that's good. We just see, we just see, we just see the outside, the exterior. I think that the Rebbe said this to someone in the Kishon in Haifa. 
and he was going over there and trying to dig in, dig in, dig in, and find. I'm familiar. <coughs> I'm familiar. So, so, so the, the role of Moshe Rabbeinu in his discussion with the Jewish people, when Hashem tells him, Salacha, what is Hashem telling him? The first interpretation was, you should get rich. Second interpretation is, you should find the, the, the statue, find the diamond, fi- be the craftsman, Moshe Rabbeinu. Find the diamond in the Jewish people, connected to each other. The first tablets which have the tzaddik and the kosher for Passover people, the people who are just amazing people, the people who haven't made mistakes, that's not where the wealth comes from. The Torah says, hey, the place where a Baal stands, a Tzai cannot stand. The place where someone who has returned to Judaism, despite all odds, and they made a real effort to make changes in their life, the place they stand, that Tzai cannot possibly stand. The wealth, the wealth, where is the wealth? The wealth is for Moshe Rabbeinu. Where is your wealth, Moshe Rabbeinu? Your wealth is in the second tablets. Your wealth is in the tshuva. Your wealth is in, is, and this is the meaning of a very fascinating story in the Talmud. We don't read the story in the Talmud. Let me tell you a story of, of Rabbi David the Rekeach, the, Bel, the previous Belzer Rebbe. In his synagogue, there was a guy who was married to a non-Jew. A, a koyin. A koyin married to a non-Jew. And so he, he wasn't allowed to bless the Jewish people. That's, that's the rule. They didn't let him do the, the brichas koyinim. That was the rule in that synagogue. And you know what happened to this guy? One day the guy threw out his shiksa. He let go of that relationship. And the Belzer Rebbe said... They asked him, can he, can he join now? He got divorced, he let go of her. Can, can, he, can he join the Bruchas Koinim? Can he bless the Jewish people? And the Bells that I was said, only he could bless the Jewish people. I don't want to hear anyone, anyone else joining him. Wow. Everyone, only, only he could do the Bracha. I don't want to hear any other Koinim. Only he could, only he. Why only he? Why only he? Because his Bracha is coming from a different place. It's coming from a different place. Coming from that, the effort that he made, he recognized, Bells that recognized something else. The story in the Gemara is like this. Mar says a story. The son of Shumi Yochai is walking in the road. And he sees an ugly man. And the ugly man says to Abelazar, Greetings unto you, my master and teacher. And Abelazar says back to the guy, You are so ugly. And the man says to Abelazar, If you don't like how I look, go to the craftsman that made me and tell him how ugly is a vessel that you made. The Lazar begs his forgiveness. The guy refused to forgive him. They go to the nearby town. Nearby town, there's a parade waiting to greet Abel Lazar. All the men, women, and children came to greet Abel Lazar. And while, and while Abel Lazar is, is being greeted, he's trying to speak to the guy, please, please forgive me. And the guy says, not going to forgive you. Abel Lazar like, prostrated himself on the ground. Please forgive me. The guy doesn't want to forgive him. Finally, he says, I'll forgive you on, on, because of all these people, not because of you. And then... And then, he, and then he says, on one condition though, what's the condition? Don't do this often. <laughs> now, it doesn't make any sense. First of all, what did Nebuchadnezzar know when he said, how ugly you are? What did he discover when the guy said, go to the craftsman that made me? What didn't he know before and what did he discover then? And what did the guy mean when he said, don't do this often? If someone slaps you in the face, you say, <laughs> I'll forgive you, don't do it often. Every two years, give me a slap in the face. What, what does it mean? There's a group of college students went to the Rebbe once. And one of them had a lot of temerity or chutzpah. And he says to the Rebbe, Hey, I heard you make miracles. Can, can you, like, how does it work? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us the secret. So the Rebbe said, Every one of you can make a miracle. Us? I'm not making miracles. What are you talking about? I don't know the exact words, but more, that, more or less it was like this. You haven't put on film today. And I understand also you haven't put on film yesterday. And I understand you don't plan to put on film tomorrow. For you to put on film is a miracle. It's a miracle. Going beyond your nature to do something good is a miracle. It's a miracle. <laughs> Rabbi Lazar, what he was saying to the man, not that he was physically ugly. He was saying he's spiritually ugly. He saw in this person an insensitivity. He saw this person as he was he had no sense of of reverence for Hashem. That's what he saw, a spiritual ugliness. Sometimes in a hospital, a person, God forbid, is 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 very in, lose, in, in danger of losing their life, they shock them. They shock them to keep them alive. If Belazar thought, this guy, there's no way to get this guy alive again. We need to shock the guy. And sometimes shocking is too strong of a medicine. And, and that's what happened over here. This man actually was a Yalanavi. 
Elyon, Navi, Elijah the prophet, was this ugly man. And he was dressed as someone who was spiritually ugly. In order to teach him or something, what was meant to teach him? What did he respond to him? He didn't say, go to God. He didn't go to God. He said, go to the craftsman that made me. He said to him, I know I'm ugly. Do you know why I'm ugly? Do you know why I'm ugly? Why did Hashem make me to be Kermit the Frog? What did, was he in, what did he want? What did he want with my ugliness? What did Hashem want to, to want to achieve with the ugly parts of our character? What is he, why did he give us ugliness? Why did he give us a desert that we have to run away from to go to the king's corral? Why didn't he just make us like the sheep which are born in the corral? Some, some big moves have to be made. And there's a lot of moves to get to the haber, from the haber. There's things we could do immediately, like go of the, the uh, and there's some things that require a lot more work, internal work. Why? The answer is, is because that's what creates the beauty. That was what creates the beauty. If you didn't have the challenges that you have, you will not be able to discover your inner soul's power. What you see from the, is from the black in your eye, not from the white in your eye. To discover your own beauty, you need to fight, you need to work. And that, and every time you overcome your temptation and you do the right thing, what you're doing is you're peeling a layer and you're, and you're getting closer to your ten, ten Commandments, to your tablets which are in you. That's the meaning of Hashem's instruction to Moshe and to each of us. Psalacha. Don't look at yourself as ugly. Don't look at yourself as, as not being who you really are. As Baruch said before, it wasn't that the Baruch Yisrael became a uh, year today, but that's, 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 that's who he always was. He had to bring it into himself. He had to reveal it. But it was something that uh, required a lot, a lot of effort. And so just like it's true for Baruch Yisrael, it's true for all of us. We have tablets, and we, have, we can't give up in, in, in revealing the goodness in ourselves, and believing in the goodness. Yeah, that's what the word craftsman means in Hebrew, Baruch. You know what craftsman means in Hebrew? How does Pesolacha give us that message? Sorry, Pesolacha, thank you. Pesolacha, the word psal comes from the word pasal, which means to be a craftsman. Another word for craftsman is uman. Uman shares the root of the word emuna, faith. To be a craftsman, you have to see something people can't see. To be a craftsman, looking at a block of wood and say, oh, this is a statue, it takes, a, it takes faith. Oh, so are you trying to say, in the way that I understand it, there was a block of wood, of uh, stone, and he could have said, oh, there's a block of stone. But no, from this block of stone, he made the tablets. You should see in this block of stone the tablets. And, and which he did. And, um, and so too is instruction to each of us sure. and to the Jewish people as a whole. Was just to oh, oh, bring out the goodness of this slab of uh, stone, bring out the goodness in it, which is the locos, which is last for eternal and right. protection. For and the bring out the goodness in Yosef Javdan. And bring out the goodness of Baruch Nufeld. And Baruch Nufeld should know about his own goodness. And Yosef Javdan should know about his Believe in your own goodness. Believe in... And that's the idea of a craftsman. A craftsman, you know, it's like a craftsman. Okay. Is it also because pesol also means pesolet, right? Is that... Is it related or is it not related? No. There is psolet. It is related. Don't look at your psolet. Look at the goodness. To, in it. order to discover your I'm diamond, in order, no, you're getting us somewhere. You're, you're helping us. In mm-hmm. order to discover your diamond, you have to take a, get rid of a lot of the psolets. You have to get rid of the other extra stuff. But, but you have to see in your, eff, in your efforts to discover your diamond, you have to get rid of a lot of psolets. And don't think because you're, you're dealing with a lot of mud, there's no diamonds there. You'll dig in that place where the, where the mud is. In, that's where the diamonds are. Like an analogy before about the guy. He found the diamonds where he was sitting. Don't think the diamonds are anywhere else. You're dealing with a lot of mud. There's no diamonds here. No. In the place where there is the mud, beneath there, beneath digging there, in your own mud, in your own insecurities, in your own anger, in your own frustration, in your own jealousy, and, and you peel away and you, and, you, and you push it away and, and you let go. You let go. That's where the diamond is. That's where the paso, you have to be a craftsman. So the word craftsman in Hebrew comes from the word faith. The, 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 the craftsman is a meshuganah. The craftsman, Michelangelo, he sees a... He, what do we, what do we, say, we, we speak to Michelangelo, what do we say? He's out of his mind. <laughs> what is he? But then he just says, no, I'm out of my mind. I'll show you. And he, and he does. And so too, Hashem tells us to be the same thing as Michelangelo in ourselves. To see in ourselves the, that the, the luchas are there. And when you're making an effort to do the right thing, and to push away the jealousy, and to push away the lust, to push away all things that are pushing you in the wrong direction, you're, what you're really doing is you are revealing your inner beauty that's there. And that's what was wrong with this guy that the Lazar thought he was way out of it. He is so incensed, he doesn't get it. But what was wrong, in, what was missing the equation, what Lazar's mistake was, the guy knew about it. He said, from my ugliness, there's something beautiful coming out of it. I am ugly. 
Why am I ugly? It's it's a, the uman. It's a craftsman. It's Hashem who is, who is is a he is a master craftsman, and he creates beauty from ugliness. From Hashem is a master craftsman, and he made me with my ugliness because he wants to create a greater kind of beauty. And only with the ugliness can you have the beauty. The same way, yeah. Only with the ugliness, only with the, with the temptation of ugliness, can there be a different kind, of, deeper kind of beauty. So, so that's why Belazar made a mistake because if the guy recognized in himself that he has that. So he didn't, he didn't need that, that shock and not treatment. That's why he said, oh, I'm so sorry. It's kind of like the dentist. The dentist goes over, he said, Yossi, what do you have in your tooth? What's wrong with your tooth? I was like, uh, I know last I couldn't sleep, I had terrible pain. Which tooth was it? He said, I don't know, it's one of these teeth. Just find it. And then it says, let me say, does this hurt? He says, no, this hurt. This hurt. Ah! That one hurts. There, there's some things which are beneath the surface. And you don't need to have a, lot, a strong medicine to discover it. Strong medicine doesn't work. If you think someone needs to have strong medicine of shock and awe, chances are, rule of thumb is, you need to take an aspirin and go to sleep. But Rabbi Lazar was a son of Shema Yochai, and he could do this sometimes that people needed it. And that's what Rabbi Al Yolnavi said to him. The man said to him, don't do it often. Some people do need it. Don't do it often because a lot of people will eventually... Um, they need softer medicine. Will, the, will acknowledge, will acknowledge their beauty is. If you notice that everyone needs medicine, everyone needs strength, you know, everyone needs encouragement, but but, but, but not every person needs that. Such, you're 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 too heavy-handed with your with your uh, with Shaka. with your shakana. You see, oh. if you reserve it only for rare occasions, okay. so that, that's not, but for ourselves, that's not something we never need. What we need to do is realize and look in ourselves and to see and to believe in who we are and what we are as Jews, Baruch Hashem. And Chaim uh, Chaim Avracha, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. Hey, you finished the mashke? Chaim Chaim Avracha. The Baruch is so much. Show us a few words. Uh, well, I I was uh, basically they asked me why 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 do you become why do you want to become Jewish today? Yeah. So I basically shared my. Uh, I mean, it was, it was very brief. Uh, I said. Uh, it's really a journey. It's a long time journey. I mean, it's been thirty years, but the first twenty years, it's more of a just searching in the world. And it's it not in Judaism, so all all different kinds of religion or or all different philosophies. So only in the last ten years, then I I, I came towards uh, this path because I feel from from just practical experience that this is the real. This is the, this is the path that has the true uh, connection to the essence of existence. So, or in the sense that, in the sense that, if you practice this path, it it, it gets you to um, be connected to what controls the universe. It's it, it's it's the it's the best. It's it's the truth. So 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 so. In the last ten years, I really honed in, and then. And then Chabad uh, really got got me going. So. <laughs> wow! So that was the that was the that's the simple story. Thirty years, in two, in two, two minutes. Yeah, thirty years. In two minutes, <laughs> 30 Are you sure you're Jewish? <laughs> <laughs> Usually, a Jew takes two minutes turns into thirty years. It's a long, long speech. You I mean, thank you for saying it very briefly, very powerfully. Thank you very much. Oh, I. I don't know. And you said it very briefly, very powerfully. Chaim, 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 chaim. Interesting. So puzzle means invalid. Right. So you have to remove the parts of yourself which are invalid oh, right. to discover the diamond inside. Absolutely. Yeah.